Okay, let's talk a little bit about international relations in the Middle East. So um, the last lecture covered mainly domestic um, politics and the major influences there, but we already hinted at, yeah, especially when it comes to military, definitely conflicts and wars play a big role, but also international relations. And we did have already covered quite extensively the influence of um, imperialism on the Middle East. And so I will come back to that, but only shortly this time. So international relations, I think the, um, the readings that make that pretty clear consists of uh, three different um, um, domains. Um, and I will look into one a little bit more specifically, and that is like the normative structure. And I, I will look at really how the US and EU promotes democracy in the region. So for the three domains, um, um, we looked at the international economic system. Um, I already talked about that um, in my economic political economy lecture, but I'll go back to that a little bit more in the international realm. Um, then the international geopolitical system, which is very significant for the Middle East, and then the global, global normative structure, um, uh, to which I will refer to as um, a democracy promotion, where we look into how the EU, European Union, and the US promote democracy in, or try to promote democracy in the region. So um, when we look at the international economic system, uh, we can see over time that since World War II, the main economies are much more integrated into the international um, trade than there were um, uh, before independence or even in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. Definitely much more integrated today, but there's much potential unexploited. So let me explain that a little bit. So we have... Um, 4% uh, pretty much of the world economy and 5% um, of the global exports are generated in, in the MENA. It's not completely um, you know, un underperforming, um, but mainly of those, uh, mostly of these exports is oil. And if you have low resources in your overall economy, no, low natural resources, um, and it means you may basically play no role in the in the global economy if you if you're a main country. Um, this is problematic because of course the exports are a big way to grow your economy if you can, especially in services and uh, manufacturing. In all of these areas, the Middle East is underperforming. Um, but although today 30, 13 main countries belong to the WTO. It's very limited. You can say the MENA makes very limited use of global trade to grow their own economy. Um, and that's not necessarily because they find it challenging to actually find market niches that really do them, but it really do have them. But it's very, um, especially if you compare them to Asia, um, very difficult for them to explore them. For example, European Union market access is one big aspect of it. Um, there are a lot of international free trade agreements um, that the region did, uh, for example, with Europe and the European, European Union as the main political institution on the continent, but also with the United States. Although with Europe, it's much more important also due to its proximity and colonial history. Um, so way more trade agreements made between um, North Africa, the Middle East and Europe than, for example, intra-regional. Um, and the Gulf Cooperation Council of Investments in the last um, decade uh, mainly stay in the Middle East, North Africa. That's interesting. That's a new development. Um, they don't go out outside the region, which is um, a good thing because we have a high um, uh, accumulation of capital and labor in this area. And but we have a few connections between them, although we do see labor migration between, for example, countries like um, Libya or Egypt to Saudi Arabia, um, uh, where they're rather labor poor areas, um, we have not seen uh, the generation of grow uh, overall in, in, in the region. So what the future might hold here um, in terms of in the international economic system is that we maybe see more interregional inter investment and trade cooperation. Um, so maybe the era of services might be already over. You know, the market is saturated globally pretty much. Um, but maybe a closer cooperation could hold here new opportunities. So, for example, we're not tapping into uh, the programming world. You know, the, you know, there's much great labor, educated labor in the Middle East, um, um, and, and and capital available. So, uh, why not um, 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 have more computer programming um, companies in the region? But yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, so it's not the point. But I still think that's an interesting development. So it's not not over yet, right? You can still explore explore new possibilities. So when we look at the second thing here, um, the impact of 
international relations and the Mainites. The geopolitical system is probably one of the most significant. Um, so the international um, support, um, you know, that a lot of readings make that point, um, is a compelling explanation for the durability, if not origin, of authoritarianism in, in the Middle East. So um, if we look at next week um, the prospects of democracy, international support for those authoritarian rulers that actually want to cooperate is a big, could be um, quite a significant explanation for why democracy will not was not able to place hold. We can say pretty much since Napoleon's conquest of Egypt in 1798, um, it has been um, uh, European powers um, uh, that have been, and the United States, and as have been done, doing the intervening in the Middle East. So except through pretty much northern Yemen and Western Arabia, pretty much every part of the Middle East was under European military control at some point in the 20th century. Um, first, European powers competed over influence in the region, um, the, the British, Italy, France, but British and the UK and, and, and France um, heading heading this um, this battle here, and then later in the second half of the century, the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So then, oil resources, of course, attracted powers, and then followed by security interests due to terrorism. You know, especially after 9/11. Um, it's pretty much only you know Libya, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and United Arab Emirates, as I've mentioned before, would not, not have exist you know would not exist today. Um, as independent political entities without foreign intervention. So um, foreign powers quite significantly shaped what we know today as the Middle East. Um, so either way, you know, depending how the interests are going, can either international parties can either stabilize or dismantle regimes. Um, we have seen that in, in various different ways. You know, Egypt, for example, was very capable, as the reading covers, um, to navigate the power struggles um, to their own um, um, advantage in, in during the Cold War, uh, while um, of course there's a very good case to make that Iran was not what the Iranian regime was not as good at it um, as, for example, also the Iraqi regime um, later on. So we've seen, um, you know, um, since the, the end of the Cold War, you know, the U.S. invasion or the U.S. is being really becoming the major um, a player in the Middle East, um, kind of taking over from Britain. Um, with the invasion of, you know, of Iraq in 2003, and then also just more recently the U.S., British, and French air support for Libyan rebels against Gaddafi, the Gaddafi regime in 2011. Um, but um, of course, more prominent, and not more prominent, probably as prominent, um, are the regional wars. Um, you know, we can count over, depending how you count them, nine Arab-Israeli wars, um, the Iraq-Iran war, Arab uh, Iraq-Kuwait, civil wars in Yemen, Oman, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria, and you can add uh, Libya to this, um, um, and of course Algeria to this um, to this list as well. So many, so there, you know, the, the Middle East is, is known for its uh, conflict, uh, or its conflict notorious, I would say, but it's definitely not, doesn't have actually much more, it uh, doesn't have more conflicts than, for example, Asia experience, but many more, much more recent in time, and probably also much more active um, uh, conflicts, you know, like the Kurdish question in Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, or of course, most prominently, uh, the war ongoing dispute be between um, uh, Palestinians and, and Israel. Um, but the threat of neighbors um, uh, that I also talked about in my last lecture about the influence of the military was often used by regimes to justify police states and restrict uh, political rights and freedoms. Um, and that is an important connection, of course. So the military is only that important um, because it wants to stabilize the regime it fights for, but obviously also because it wants to bring up a, a, a national identity. And as you remember, most of um, Arab um, citizens rather uh, identify themselves with their tribe or their language or religion than with their, their country. Um, so with this complex history or political, geopolitical game, I would say, as a backdrop, it's not very surprising that um, many regimes um, are hostile um, uh, to the normative dimension of international politics. 
So uh, when it comes, especially um, you know, in terms of the U.S. and what the Euro and what Europe is doing in the region, I cannot say that there has been much positive experience, and hence the the um, the, the task of taking on um, the promotion of democracy as an international norm um, uh, is obviously very challenging. But looks, let's let's look into that. So. Um, the international normative structure has much more to it than just the promotion of democracy. It's more than an idea that human and individual rights, international law, and governance standards have um, that have developed in the West have universal ap uh, applicability also to the Middle East or pretty much everywhere in the world. So when it comes to Europe, the way that that is done is um, often through, you know, well, mainly through the offer of membership to the European Union, a major political institution, organization in Europe, and also through trades. For example, Turkey has a, a membership perspective. Uh, Morocco applied for EU membership, but then was um, denied um, in 87 due to um, the non europeanness of the country. So it's very much through soft means, and we'll talk about that in a second, what that really means. On the other hand, we have the U.S. that uh, formulated its its promotion of these these uh, standards of democracy through military and political initiatives. So how does that work, like specifically? So why you know promote democracy in the first place? Um, uh, we 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 do have several theories at least developed that. Um, uh, define democracy as a world, world value. You know, you have a guarantee for prosperity and human rights, and that kind of develops into economic development and peace. So, for one hand, it was kind of the the West's answer to the struggling economic development in the Middle East, as well as the struggling um, uh, the ongoing wars. So, it's not necessarily just something that they came out of the blue, but also an idea to kind of transform the Middle East uh, from within. So, the European Union. And that's the main political organization in Europe, where all European states belong to, um, is defined itself by civilian power. So there's no military means to do any form of democracy promotion. Um, and the idea of promoting democracy was more an integrated piece of the European integration process. Um, I can't go into much details here, but other than being the birthplace of democracy, of course, with Greece, the European Union really used democracy as, um, for example, um, a way of integrating uh, former dictatorships such as Portugal or Spain or Greece, uh, as well as the former Soviet states, um, all the Central Eastern European countries that became um, members of the European Union in 2005. Um, so the U.S., of course, on the other hand, has much different ways of doing that. Of course, the most prominent example is the Iraqi war, which started out as a um, um, as a war against terrorism, but then also quickly turned into a, um, a way of promoting democracy in the Middle East. So they, instead of doing it through civilian means, the U.S. chose the military uh, way of, of, of promoting democracy, and we all know how that ended up. It was really the idea of uh, protecting, you know, um, uh, also uh, having the responsibility, responsibility globally to protect and advance democracies around the world and kind of be see themselves as a role model for democracy. Um, I think that these are the biggest differences between U.S. and EU policies. But of course, in both cases, it was fairly difficult to um, to promote um, because of their um, historical intervention in the region. Um, but both countries or both entities more recently uh, use the means of trade um, to promote democracy. And to which extent these efforts actually play into the Arab Spring is very hard to measure. Um, However, um, uh, we do see the constant um, struggle um, uh, of these policies in the region. So we have fairly little success um, in both of these initiatives. Um, authoritarian regimes in the MENA are very persistent, and the MENA is still uh, a desert of democracy in the world. Now, um, but why? And if did the Arab Spring actually make any difference? Uh, this is puzzling, you know, until today, pretty much, and not yet conclusively answered. Uh, but we will dive e deeper into that question um, the next week with lectures and the readings, and of course your own research on your final paper. So let's summarize. Um, we do have the three domains of international relations that um, the MENA is nestled in: this international economic, the geopolitical, the normative system, and all three have, have posed their own challenges. Um, economically, the MENA is more integrated into the world trade.
than it has, but there's much potential unused. Uh, geopolitical, it has been and is still a key region in the world for many foreign powers, um, and their interventions changed the MENA significantly, meddling with domestic affairs. Um, uh, did not make the modernization of the Middle East easier, but often uh, authoritarian regimes more stable. Hence, the limited impact of the innovative, of the innovative system is not, is not surprising. Democracy promotion efforts by the EU and the US pretty much remained limited and um, often seen as a direct, actually, contradiction of the prevailing security interests of both areas. For example, just take the refugee crisis. Um, uh, uh, today, um, or also the, the war against terrorism. You have democracy on the one hand and secure on the other. The idea is also in the way towards democracy, you always have more instability, which doesn't serve your security interests. So the question remains, why did the MENA not democratize why the rest of the world did? Um, and I think I gave you a couple good hints this week and last week, and we will dive into this question in more details next week. So I'm looking forward to your country briefs and um, let me know if you have any questions.